Hello students, this is your first mini lecture provided to you by Tegrity. I hope you find this helpful. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the topics from chapter one using as your guide the chapter goals from the textbook. What is matter? How it's classified is the first one. How are chemical elements represented? And what kind of properties does matter have? I will ask your patience as I experiment with the new device that I am going to be using that allows me to write on the slides, which is a little bit less than simple until I'm a little more comfortable. Give me some time, we'll be good. Okay, let's go from there. So to begin with, the elements are organized in the periodic table, which I hope you've seen and we will soon become very familiar with. You need to realize that there are different groups of elements. The first group is called metals. They are on the left side of a zigzag line in the periodic table. This picture here represents the same version that you see on the inside cover of your textbook. The tan color, if that's what it looks like to you, represents the metals in this chart, and that's the largest sec section of the periodic table. The second section, second largest section of the table is the nonmetals, and these are on the right side of that zigzag line in the periodic table that I just marked for you. They're shown in a bluish shade here. Not very many of them, a triangular section of the periodic table. The third category is the metalloids. The metalloids are only a few that lie along this zigzag line in the middle of the periodic, on the right side of the periodic table. So those are different categories that you need to be familiar as you're learning to know elements and their names. With time, they'll all become more familiar. Do notice that hydrogen, element number one over here is on the left, which is shown as a non-metal, which is true in spite of its location. Hydrogen is a gas. It does not have any of the characteristics of a metal. All right, here's some examples of some chemical elements, and each of these are representing one category of elements. I bet you can guess which one it is. These are metals. Some characteristics that you may have found if you were reading the textbook that describe metals include the fact that it's 94 of the known elements, quite a few. They are on the left side of the periodic table. They are solid at room temperatures, except for mercury. Things that are like coins and keys that in your pocket are jingly, those are metals. Usually they're lustrous when they're freshly cut. They're shiny in that sense. They are good conductors of heat and electricity and they're malleable. That means they can be pounded into sheets rather than being brittle. If you have any guesses whatsoever, or if you saw them in the book, you'll realize that there are three metals shown here. The first one is, you guessed it, surprise, gold symbol is AU. The second one is zinc, not that you could tell because a lot of them look like grayish silvery substances. And the third one is copper, which is used in pipes and tubings. The second set of elements shown here are another category. The one on the left is a liquid with gas all around it. The second one is an interesting yellow substance. And the third one is looks like little metal shavings. Well, in fact, they're not metals because all three of these things are nonmetals. If you looked in your textbook, you would find these attributes that typically describe nonmetals. They are 18 of the known elements, not so very many. They occur on the right side of the periodic table. 11 of them are gases, 6 are solids, and 1 only, bromine, is a liquid. In other words, they're no one particular type of physical state. Metals are solids, nonmetals are a mixture of things. They are poor conductors of heat and electricity, and they are things that have varying properties, unlike the metals. Metals are much more similar in their properties. These things tend to be brittle when they're solid, but as you can tell from the Sample on the left, which is nitrogen. It does not occur as a solid in, in any ordinary conditions. The second one in the middle is sulfur, which is indeed quite yellow as a solid. It's um, very definitely brittle and can't be pounded into sheets like metals. And the third one is an interesting one that is actually iodine, which looks like little gray silvery things, which are very different from the other two nonmetals shown here. So they vary quite a bit in their characteristics. The third set of elemental categories you can guess my, by now would be what remains here, and so that would be the metalloids. The characteristics that typically describe these are not all exactly that um, concise. There are only a few of them, six of them are known as metalloids. 
Their properties are somewhere between metals and nonmetals, therefore not especially easily described. And they occur in that zigzag band between the metals on the left and the nonmetals on the right side of the periodic table. The two shown in this diagram are boron and silicon. Silicon used in semiconductors, as you might guess. All right, now to go on further with other topics from chapter one, we need to learn about changes. There are physical changes, and when you have a physical change, it doesn't change the chemical nature of the substance. So that's what we're looking at when we're trying to determine whether something is chemical or physical, it, whether it changes the chemical nature of the substance. In general, we're going to only see things where there's changes of state. So a change of state is a physical change. Uh oh, I've got to learn how to use my tool better. Change of state. Whoops, sorry about that, dang. All right, so physical changes are changes of state, melting, boiling, shattering, flattening. You haven't changed the chemical nature, the chemical composition of a substance when you have a physical change. The opposite, or the other alternative then, is a chemical change, where something does change the identity of the substance. Some kind of chemical reaction has to take place. In this um, diagram, you see a picture of burning potassium in water, which is definitely a chemical change. Very exciting to watch. In fact, lots of heat and light are given off. All right. There are ways of representing these things on an atomic and molecular level that are described as picture diagrams. Not everyone likes them, but they're a good way of thinking about things on a molecular level. When we can't exactly see things, we can make um, representations for them on two-dimensional paper. Here we have something on the left that would be, looks like Mg, which is magnesium. Magnesium is a metal, and above it is, what do you see, is two oxygens together. Well, that would be, two, I mean, two O's together represents the element oxygen. So we'll write oxygen over here. And on the right box, we have something else now. We see something that has little plus signs on the Mg and little minus signs on the oxygen. Now, is this a chemical or a physical change? Well, the real bottom line is, has the chemical nature of these substances been changed? If you think about it for a minute, I would hope you agree with me that this has to be a chemical change because the magnesium has turned into something with magnesium having a charge. Whoops, it was my tool. My tool. It's going to have what we call a 2 plus charge. And the oxygen goes from occurring in pairs, which it does in normal situations called O2 and now as a result it ends up with something that has two negative charges. That is definitely a chemical change. It's no longer oxygen showing here on the left as a gas and now it is combined in the middle with this magnesium. The result is that we have magnesium and oxygen ions in these cases. These are known as ions. We'll talk more about ions later. All right, another example. Is this one a chemical or physical change? On the left, you will see, I hope you can recognize, that there might be something here. Whoops, I forgot to use my tool correctly. There would be something here that has two hydrogens and an oxygen. Guess what that would be? Surprise, surprise, it's water. And that would be all on the top in this diagram. On the bottom, we have Na+, which would be an ion for sodium. And we have Cl minus another ion for chlorine. Those two ions are shown here at the bottom in this diagram. And the water is shown at the top. As a result of this process, afterwards you see little individual sodium ions here and here and over here. And then what else is there? There's these chloride ions. And they're in a different arrangement than they used to be. And there are water molecules yet all around in the diagram. Is this a chemical or a physical change? Has the chemical nature of these substances been altered as a course of this process? I hope that if you think about it, you will agree that this is really only a physical change. We have only combined the two substances and put them together 
And you can reverse the change by taking away the water. How do you reverse the change? How do you take away the water? By, what do you do to remo remove water? Uh-oh, this tool isn't going to write for me today. Oops. Evaporation. And that is how you get rid of the extra water. Okay. I'm not happy with the way this tool works today. I'm going to have to work on this before I move to the next recording. Sorry about that, folks. All right. Now, continue. Here's another example. Is this a chemical or a physical change? On the left, what do you see? It looks like two ends together. That would have a chemical formula that we probably would want to represent as N2, suggesting that there are two atoms together connected in a compound, or a molecule in this sense, a molecule. And on the right side we see N2 again, but they're arranged differently. Here they're farther apart. On the left they're separated. And on the right they're very close together. Well, what could be happening in here that gives this kind of a difference? If you have them far apart on the left, um, there must be a reason that they are separated. Well, what would it be? Perhaps they're in two different chemical or physical states. Say that carefully. Physical states. So the one on the left is probably something that looks like the nitrogen compound is moving around differently or not especially fixed in place. So this could be a liquid, or it could be maybe even a gas, depends on how close together they are. On the right, we have nitrogen organized in very orderly fashion where they're in rows packed together side by side. This would suggest that nitrogen might be turned into a solid. So is this diagram representing a chemical or a physical change as you go from the left to the right? Think about it for a minute. And what do you suppose? Must be, in this case, a physical change because the chemical nature hasn't changed. It's just the physical state going from a liquid or a gas to a solid. It has to get cold to do that. All right, let's do some more examples using these picture diagrams that represent atoms and molecules. These are things that you need to get familiar with because they're helpful to our being able to understand various kinds of processes. All right, on the left. We want to decide if it's an element or a compound, is it a mixture or is it pure? Well, you have to analyze and see what's in the diagram. And I see carbon, C is carbon, with two sulfurs after it, and that are attached to it, say that carefully. And that would mean that it has a formula of CS2. If you look at the diagram, all of the little atoms in this diagram are connected in the same way, in the same proportions. Well, that would suggest that everything in here is all the same, and therefore it must be pure. Is it an element or is it a compound? Well, if you have carbon and sulfur, carbon and sulfur are two different elements, therefore this has to be a compound. Not just one element, but two things combined in a chemical compound, in this case a molecule. All right, example number two on the right. Element or compound, mixture or pure. If you analyze the um, contents in the rectangle here, we see pairs of I, which must be iodine. It looks a little hilarious. It looks like I staring at you, actually. But these are arranged in a very orderly fashion, similar to the nitrogen we saw in the previous examples. And they're packed together in a very orderly fashion. But there isn't anything in here except that letter I. So therefore, this must be something that's a quite pure. They all look the same, and if there's only one chemical similar symbol in there, it has to be an element. So this is a sample of representation for iodine. It has a chemical formula. Its pure substance will always have a chemical formula, and it would be an element in this case because there's only one compound or only one substance represented here. Next example. Here we have element, compound, mixture, and pure in two more ways. So, on the left rectangle, what do we see in the left rectangle? I see, again, pairs of I together. I see also a big thing that looks kind of six-sided. And if I had to think about it, what in the world would the f there be a way to represent that as a formula, perhaps? Well, the first one, again, is iodine. 
It occurs in pairs in little molecules. And the other one, let's list the carbon first. There are six of them per ring. And attached to those are, each one has a hydrogen on it, so there must be six hydrogens. If you analyze the diagram carefully, there's nothing else in the diagram. They're all the same thing. So they're not just a pure substance because there's two different ones. So in this case, it has to be a mixture. And are, is it a mixture of elements or compounds? Well, the iodine is an element. And the C6H6 happens to have a name, but you don't have to know that until you get to Chem 116. That is a compound known as benzene. So it's, it's a mixture of an element with a compound. All right, example number four. What do we see this time? If you analyze the diagram, you should be able to recognize what's in there and see if it has a chemical formula, perhaps. And are there more than one ways these are shown in this particular example? If you count up their carbons, there's ox hydrogens, and there are is also oxygen in that circled um, formula or a circled molecule. And how many carbons are there? There would be two. Think about it. If you counted them up, it looks like six hydrogens and a single oxygen. So it has a chemical formula. Therefore, it must be some kind of a compound. Compounds have a chemical formula. And everything represented in the box looks like it has the same formula. So this would be a pure substance. And it is a formula. It is a compound. It, any pure substance has a chemical formula. That's one way to recognize when something is pure, is it has a chemical formula. All right, there you go. So the ones that have chemical formulas are going to be pure substances. Pure. Oops, oh, pull back up. I didn't know it was going to not write for me. Pure substances. All right, next slide. One more pair of examples. All right, on the left. Mixture of pure. That's the first question to answer. Are, is what you see in the box all the same thing? I think that you can identify that there is one thing that says HE, the other one says XE. If you look at your trusty periodic table, you'll recognize that those are two different elements that occur in the rightmost column on the periodic table. HE is element number two. It's helium. And XE is xenon, much further down in the periodic table. Must be element 54. Yeah. And not that you have to know the numbers. So there's two different elements in there, but is this a pure substance or is this a mixture? It has to be a mixture because there's two different things in there. All right. Right box. Number six. Is it mixture or pure? Well, look around again. What do we see? This one has two fluorines together. It has a chemical formula. And... There's only one kind of thing in this box, so apparently this is a pure substance. Now, is it an element or is it a compound? There's two atoms together, and this would be similar to another example we saw a little while earlier. In this case, there's only one kind of atom present, so this is an element. It occurs as molecules. That doesn't mean it's not still an element, even if it is occurring as molecules here. All right. Now, let's look at another example of chemical and physical changes and whether we can determine how these things are shown in chemical reactions. There are things that are described as reactants and there are things that are shown as products. How do you show them in uh, chemical representation? This um, picture shows um, an interesting reaction where there's nickel. The nickel is down here, the little solid pellets, reacting with a liquid that's called hydrochloric acid, and they're going to combine and something is going to form as a result. That would be a change in the chemical components. So instead of having just nickel and HCl, hydrochloric acid, you result in two new substances, which is, the first one has a name, it's called nickel 2 chloride, and the second one is called hydrogen. Therefore, if you have new substances formed, this would have to be a chemical change. And so new substances, new chemical formulas result. And that's how your uh, 
have for what you're looking for to identify this. Okay, new chemicals form. Now let's analyze this a little bit more closely and see how that reaction looks. Right now you can't tell that there's anything going to happen because they haven't been mixed. So if you mix them together, you put the solid into the test tube and the liquid becomes, a liquid covers the solid and the liquid is no longer clear. It's gaining a color. And if you look very closely, those little tiny bubbles in there represent something happening. Something is changing in this process. If you wait long enough, you will see that something can be isolated from this test tube with the green liquid and the solid at the bottom. Eventually, you end up with something that's a whole new, wholly new looking item. Turns out that it is this nickel to chloride which is what would be isolated if you remove the liquid from it after that reaction. So what were the clues that a chemical change was taking place even if I hadn't shown you formulas? There are important things to realize that are clues to chemical changes. You're going to learn about this in lab later in the semester. One is there's a change of color. Another is that the nickel has dissolved, which isn't completely evident, but that's where the color change comes from here. And the appearance of bubbles. In this case, the bubbles are a... Um, indication that hydrogen gas, H2, which is the way hydrogen always occurs, is being formed in that reaction. A chemical change indeed. So nickel is a hard shiny metal. The hydrogen chloride is a colorless gas. When you combine it with water, we call it hydrochloric acid. When the nickel is added to the hydrochloric acid, the nickel is eaten away, the solution turns green, and a gas bubbles out. All right, now, here's a couple more examples, and we're almost done for the day. Which of the following is an observation of a physical property? If there's something that burns in oxygen, if it melts at 76 degrees Celsius, it forms a white precipitate, it decomposes in air, or cooks at a high temperature. Which of these is a physical property? It has to do with physical changes, no chemical things. Well, take a hint. Can't be this one. Burning is a chemical change. What about melting? Is that a physical change? Is it telling you about a physical characteristic? Seems like a good prospect, but let's do a multiple choice thorough answering analyst analysis. Uh, number three, making a precipitate. That would be indication of something changing again. Probably not that, that shouldn't be just a physical property. Decomposing, again, that would be changing of a chemical substance in a chemical, uh, chemical formula. So that would be also a chemical change. Last one, cooks at a high temperature. Well, what is cooking? Cooking means something is changing again in a chemical formula. So the one that's a physical property here has to be the one that describes a melting. Next example, and I think this is my last slide today. Which of the following is an observation of a chemical property? An orange crystal, it boils at 112, it smells like mint, it ignites in water, it shatters when hammered. If you think about the things that represent chemical changes, there's something chemical reaction happening. Physical changes or physical properties have to do only with um, changes of state. And so the chemical property has to be the one where something is changing a state. And the shattering can't be that, can't be boiling, that's just changing a state. Orange crystal, that's just describing what something looks like. What the smell is, that's again a physical property. So something igniting in water would be the end would be the uh, physical chemical, pro chemical property. All right, I hope these examples have been helpful to you and that you can use these to help you study. One more slide, just for humor's sake. Here's a slide that represents a funny thing about liquids. Then we think about states of matter and physical and chemical changes, liquids and solids and gases. Cats must be liquids if you can take the shape of the container while maintaining constant volume. So apparently cats are a liquid. Well, who cares? They're yeah, good for humor anyway. All right, happy chemistry. Good luck with your studying. Let me know when you have questions.